Hi, I'm Dr. D. Leitner, and welcome to The Doctor's Den, where I interview friends and former students to hear their stories, learn from their personal and professional growth, and hear about how they are engaging politics, strategy, and leadership in their everyday lives. So join us as we deep dive into the lives of everyday people and try to learn some important lessons along the way. Welcome to The Doctor's Den. Hi, welcome back. Today we are interviewing Simone Soek, a New York-based author, journalist, and content producer, my student several, many years ago at this point. Born and raised in Turin, Italy, he lived in the United States, Italy, and Israel. He's an adjunct professor at the Department of Speech and Communication at Turo College and a content marketing manager in a tech company. Um, he specializes in targeted communications, and he has published in the Associated Press, Tablet Magazine, The Forward, Vanity Fair, more importantly, he has a debut novel, The Wide Angle, which was published in 2017. And as far as I'm concerned, perhaps the most special thing about him is that he's an advocate for people who are affected by complex regional pain syndrome, something we have in common. So, uh, Simone, it is a pleasure to have you. Welcome to the welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Leitner. Before I actually deep dive with you, can you just give me a brief, like, since college, since university, what have you been up to? What's been going on? Yeah. So um, I graduated from college in 20 sec- 2016, so it would be six years ago now. And Oh, my gosh. It actually feels like so much has happened since then, and it has. And what have I been up to? So my... <laughs> My first job after graduating from Barilan or NYU or both. Take your pick. <laughs> uh, just from Bar- Let's start from Barilan. When you graduated, what was the first thing? Wh- what did you do? What was the- you you finished Barilan? What was the first thing you chose to do? Yes. Yeah, so um, I went to grad school at NYU, and that was my biggest dream. I wanted to go to journalism school either mm-hmm. in London or New York. Um, I ended up picking New York. I got a better scholarship there, and I just. Uh, I think it was it was just a phenomenal experience. I really wanted to master writing in English and just becoming a very um, good reporter and learning from the best. And I think as a non-native English speaker, it was really a good choice for me. Um, I got a student job at NYU while I was at NYU, which was really great because obviously New York is so crazy expensive. And that was... <laughs> Quite a shock to move there from Givat Shmuel in Israel, where okay. I was living when you were my professor. Okay. And uh, my job was, I was an editor at, um, at a student magazine called the New York Transatlantic. And it was really awesome because I got to cover all sorts of European events in the city. I got to go to a lot of uh, events, meet um, some interesting people, learn about politics, literature, history, uh, the arts in many different European countries. And that was pretty much my job. After graduating from NYU, that's where I got lost a bit, I have to be honest. So on one hand, I had some aspects of my life uh, very well figured out. So I knew what I wanted to do. I knew who I wanted to be with, um, my partner. And I knew I wanted to stay in New York a little bit longer. But on the other hand, the industry I was trying to get into um, um, kind of was... um, didn't seem to want me as much as I wanted to be there. Um, okay. So I was a freelance mostly for about nine months. And it took me those, it took me nine full months before I got an actual job. So um, I was working like small gigs, freelancing, writing, um, even doing things that were not related to journalism, obviously. And even then, I, I had to confront a really harsh reality nine months later. What happened is that I got my dream job and mm-hmm. it was an entry level position at one of the most prestigious news organizations in the world. Okay. And I can say what it was, but um, it was okay. really big and I was so proud. Okay. This was like a highlight of my life, I felt. Okay. And um, the pay was really awful, but I was so excited. And um, then there was a silly, the silliest mix up with my visa, like something so silly that could have been solved so easily. And the organization kind of freaked out and they dropped me like a hot potato. Oy, boy, boy. Wow. So they really rescinded, they just rescinded my offer and they just refused to talk to me. And I had given so much, I had sacrificed so much to get there. I, um, there was really a lot of sweat and tears that went into it. And there I was alone again and I felt like I had no dignity because they were not even willing to speak to me. Um, 
nobody fought for me. I contacted so many people and then mm. a miracle happened. And that's where I feel like really got looked down because uh, um, when I say a miracle, I really mean a miracle. Okay? Like a miracle, a proper miracle. I get it. I got just called. I had applied like two months earlier for a communications job that I just applied for because of whatever. And then mm -hmm. I just... Uh, um, I got a call. I'm like, are you still interested? And it was a very well-paying job. It was remote. It was working from home, which was pre-pandemic, which was perfect because we'll talk about it later. I was already, um, I was already sick at that point. Mm. And um, I took it with no hesitation. Um, and, and I just I jumped on it. I mean, I didn't literally jump. I couldn't, but I jumped on it. And I feel like I grew up so much overnight it's amazing how often we said, I like, I yeah, said, I yeah, walked yeah. into a room. No, I didn't. I rolled into the room, right? How many times do you find yeah. ourselves using terminology? Yeah, like, no, right? I didn't really do that. I really wish I could have. Wow. Okay. Sorry, yeah. I interrupted you. Go ahead. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, it's literally funny. I, it happens to me all the time. So I, I, I just, uh, I feel like I grew up so much overnight due to that experience. So I feel like I no longer trust people as much. I've become a little more cynical and that can be a little healthy sometimes. So you're saying you've gotten a little bit jaded. Mm-hmm, definitely, for sure. And I didn't really look back from there. It was really a turning point because I still freelance for a couple of news, news organizations, which I love doing. That's my true passion. I love writing, I love reporting, I love telling people stories. Um, I, I feel like I know how to do that very well because I've done it so many times and I've interviewed some just really remarkable people. Uh, but I've been just working in marketing and communication since then. I was first in academia and then in tech. And now I'm in tech. And that's kind of my happy place now, I feel, because I feel, I feel appreciated. I feel challenged. I feel stimulated. I work with smart people and I make a good salary, which honestly is so important. And we're not going to talk about it later, but just can we just talk about money for a second? Because we can talk about money now. We can talk about money later. What if you want? No, I just don't want to sugarcoat it. I'm not materialistic. I don't care about clothes. I don't care about things. Yes, of course, I love traveling. I love eating well. But um, I, I, it's so easy to say money is not important when you have it. And when you don't have it, it's just really important. So that meant a lot to me to finally start making a good living and kind of having my own my own, just holding my own. Yeah. That's amazing. I'm really, really glad that you were able to find that resolution. And more importantly, I'm glad that you learned that lesson. Cause I think that's a lesson, which, you know, we hear a lot. Oh, money's not important. Money's not important. Find the job you're going to enjoy. Make sure you're really enjoying yourself. But if you can't provide for yourself, at least the basics, a house, food, the ability to get to and from work and, and some money to enjoy your life. Right. And uh, like, the basics even include that nowadays basics include you need a phone. You need a cell phone nowadays to live in the Western world because mm. half of what you do is done through applications on your phone. So I can totally understand how you're saying, wait a second, as much as I'm not materialistic, there is an inherent aspect of money's important. It's how we provide for ourselves. It's, it's, it's how Maslow would say, you know, you need security. Well, part of that is job security, that sense of, hey, we have enough money to be able to provide ourselves with the basic needs that we have in our life. So I get it. It makes, it makes perfect sense. Um, I'm curious because you are, I remember you to be very passionate about certain things. Like you were very passionate about Beyonce, which I don't think has changed. Um, but you were very passionate about certain things when you were a student. Have, have you found that those passions have changed a little bit now that you've sort of grown and you're developed? And I mean, forgetting the CRPS for a second, because I think that that's not a passion. That's something that you, you face and deal with, and it's a reality in your life. But do you feel like your passions have changed a little bit now that you've experienced journalism and you've experienced NYU and you've experienced that process of moving into high tech? Has, has that changed for you a little bit? Um, the easy answer is no. I'm still completely obsessed with Beyonce, to be honest. <laughs> and it, you might have gone into this interview thinking, oh, let's see if Simone has evolved since then. No, you no, 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 that's exactly what I said. I have no expectation. No, 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 wait a second. I time out, time out, time out. I have no expectation <laughs> that you've given up on Beyonce. That was not what I said. I said, except Beyonce. Also, like, okay, I'm putting CRPS no, out right. for But except Beyonce, because it was clear to me that that was never going to change. I'm talking about, like, those deeper passions about 
about like wanting to change, like changing the world and like wanting to really influence. Have you felt like those sort of things have sort of been a little bit more minimalized as you're looking more in, as like, like life stuff that you have to deal with? Like, I, do you understand what I'm saying? Does it make sense? A hundred percent. Like, I feel like, first of all, I wanted everything to happen right away. And now I have the patience and the just I've acquired that patience to say, hey, this might not happen or this might happen in, and it might look very different from what you expected it to look like. Or this might happen in a while and you're going to mm -hmm. have to find very creative ways to make it happen. So I still am passionate about writing. I'm still passionate about journalism. I'm still passionate about telling stories, but that is not might not be happening in the exact same order that I had envisioned when I was in college. I just, I had this very clear plan and I think CRPS definitely changed my, um, changed everything. And uh, so I had to face a new reality, not being able to find the exact career path that I had envisioned also changed things. So I think that I, I am, I still do hold those passions very close to my heart, but I'm much more open to the fact that they I don't know how that's going to look like and I don't know how that's going to happen but um but I definitely I'm going to be keep my eyes very open because some things might come my way that if I don't keep my eyes very open I might not even recognize them so that that that's how my passions I think have evolved my dreams have evolved so as you've yeah. sort of been growing in your professional life um I'm assuming that you've also been exposed to many different kinds of, I'm going to call it politics, because that's the realm that I come from, you know, different ideas clashing about what's important and, and how we should express things and, and, and just the nature of different ideas and how they're expressed, especially as someone who engaged in journalism and is now dealing as someone as in communications in high tech. Um, we talk about branding. We talk about how people have to deal with, um, you know, like they talk about, um, I mean, LGBTQ and how it impacts the 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 high tech world, or how it's expressed by companies in the high tech world, or or you know, human rights and how it's dealt with in 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 business. And there's so many different ideas out there that are clashing. I'm wondering how you experience that. How like how do you feel that in your daily life in work? Oh, that's such an interesting question. So first of all, it comes to just ideas and politics. I just want to say, like, um, I, I, there is something that you taught us about the hierarchy of ideas that I still um, just that I still hold very close to my heart. So um, let me just collect my thoughts for a second. So Go um, <laughs> over the course of our lives, obviously, we all um, develop our own hierarchy of ideas, right? And we all have these political beliefs and values and ideas, and we kind of rank them from the most important to the least important. And the top ones are, I think, the ones that we're not really willing to compromise on so much. And the lower ones are obviously we're more willing to compromise on. on. And over the years, my hierarchy obviously has changed. Um, but, um, when it doesn't change, well, then I guess you're a very static person and I'm not sure that would work for me. I, I try to just absorb new ideas and try to evolve as time goes by, but I do have my core beliefs and they're the pillars that I build my life on, right? So, um, many of my ideas have remained the same over the years, but they have, but then they might have shifted their ranking or their position over the years. So obviously identity has very much informed some of my political views, just mm -hmm. who I am and, um, where I come from, uh, whether it's just, uh, I just, I have the intersection of identities in my, in, in, in just the skinny body. And I just like, I... <laughs> I, I live with it every day and I just, it's, it's complex. And um, also, how do I absorb new ideas? Let's see, I just want to say sometimes I've absorbed other people's ideas because they've resonated so much with my values as I was exposed to them. And sometimes they've clashed with other people's ideas and we could talk about that later if you want. But, um, and it does hurt when you um, don't align when you don't align, your ideas don't align with uh, the ideas of the people you love and you kind of need to readjust to that reality. And it's not always easy. And one of our instincts sometimes is so that we tend to love the people that have, we have something in common with, right? Um, 
our siblings, we had a similar childhood um, to them and our friends, we share values and experiences and memories with them. And then sometimes the opposite happens. You're drawn towards people for completely uh, different reasons. And that's really special, I think. So just want to shout out to Joachim, my husband. Before, um, before, even before we knew so many of our ideas aligned, um, we just came together like two magnets, right? Um, it was just literally magnetic. And I saw him at the entrance of this cafe where we had um, just scheduled our first date. We had met on, on an app online and we just had decided to have, grab coffee. And I just saw him standing there and waiting for me and just we clicked like two magnets and everything was else was kind of irrelevant. So um, it's also it's special amazing. sometimes. There's all you just turn all that noise of the politics and the ideas and the beliefs down and just just let yourself be really human. Okay, I'm, I have two directions I can take this. I can I can ask questions about your yeah. Your I'm sorry, I'm with kind of over the place. No, no, too. it's really okay. No, it's great. Um, I'm thinking I want to ask you about your experience as an LGBTQ. I didn't say that well, but LGDP, LGBTQ mm-hmm. okay. um, professional. How are you experiencing that in your professional life? I mean, I'm I know that the tech world tends to be for the most part, very open and accessible. But at the same time, I know that that's, there's clashes going on in the business world uh, over how do we express ourselves and are we willing to put up the rainbow flag during, you know, Pride Month? And or are we willing to have that on our, like, have our logo changed? And I'm wondering, on the one hand, I want to talk to you about that. On the other hand, I really would love to hear about how you, in, in on a more personal level, are creating your world given the choices you've made about the ideas. Like you've said, I had to deal with ideas and I want to like, has your ideology changed? Like, have you felt yourself moving on those, in each of those core ideas on an idea, like in, in an ideological perspective where it was like, I was more this and now I'm finding on the same idea, a little bit more that on that idea now. So I'm going to ask you the first one first, because I really do want to hear a little bit from the professional side. What is it like to be uh, gay in, in in the high tech world? What how's, How are you experiencing that? And and yeah. have you experienced clashing ideas there in your in your life? I'm sure I'm assuming you have. Absolutely. So, um, first of all, as you, you correctly stated, um, in tech, it's just it happens to be a more um, a more open minded space where I am not so afraid to be myself. On the other hand, I also believe in just having some sort of separation between my personal life and my professional life. So it's not like I walk in a room and and I just uh, say, hey, this is who I am. This is what I do. And it's just like, first and foremost, there is work and my professional identity. This is my experience. This is I, this is what I know how to do well. And this is what I would lear- would love to learn. And then, however, a lot of these things come up. So so quickly like even just the fact that i have crps comes up within the first five seconds there's no Don't way touch to my hide leg. It. like i'm not no yeah i'm not in a wheelchair um which uh, which i i acknowledge my privilege in, in terms of that but at the same time just like i'm somebody starts talking to me i'm like chair 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 like i need to sit right away and i don't i'm not afraid to say it or mm-hmm. Oh, uh, let's go grab coffee downstairs, like elevator. Uh, no, I'm not t- taking the stairs. I just like, say it right away. And the same co- uh, applies to just saying, yeah, I have a husband. I don't have a wife um, or or just like all of that. Right. And it's just that sometimes people. Wait, it's not like you walk. You're saying it's not like I walk in with a sign on my forehead or a sign on my chest that says, hi, I am this, this, right. this, this, this. And I suffer from this, 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 this and this. But it means you have what's called an invisible illness, which yeah. means you have to advocate for that on a regular basis. Yeah. Right? And at the same time, yeah. it's it's tiring to have to advocate for something all the time. Advocate for yourself about something that you, you deal with all the time. Um, like, that's my experience. Having to advocate for myself on a regular basis. But these, these things are... I mean, they're not the same. Like, one is one is something which is not something you necessarily have to advocate for. You don't have to advocate um, in, your per, in your business world for your right to have a husband. That's your right. And, like, that's not something that business has... Can, I mean, can a business fire you for that legally? 
no, <laughs> right? And, you know, they would have to come up with many excuses why they would want to fire you other than that. Or could they make your life miserable because of it? Possibly, if they're really opposed to the idea, but, uh, you know what I mean? Like, but you have to advocate for yourself when it comes to having a, a hidden illness. Like, on the one hand, you say you have privilege because you, you can walk, Absolutely. and I'm in a wheelchair. I want to say I have privilege because people see me and they automatically know that there's something wrong with me. Right, right. They look at me. They don't know what. A lot of people think I'm 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 paraplegic, and it's like, no, 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 don't touch my legs, stay away. But like, right. At least they yeah. can see that there's something wrong. You have to actually advocate for yourself in a much more intense, real way, so that people know there is something wrong with me, and that means, I mean, and it's not wrong. Like that's such a mm -hmm. bad way to say that. I suffer from X, and because I suffer from X, I need to advocate for self. That has got to be a very exhausting thing to have to do on a regular basis yeah and the first when it you have to you kind of have to it's the same thing that they say about like also being um lgbtq like you kind of have to come out so many times throughout your lives like you never it never ends the coming out process um unless as you said you walk around with kind of like a sign saying who you are what you are but even that would be coming out but um look these things come out come up right away and then I've after the first few times that I've done it which I was really panicking before just like the day the first day of work instead of being either excited or or concerned about oh will they like me will I do a good job instead I'm like they're freaking out about like how do I bring up CRPS right away so that I can minimize the damage that I'm gonna do today and to my body and how do I do it in a very light and easygoing way and just a uh, natural way and then you discover that people actually are really uh human everybody um everybody knows someone who has something or has their own story and it just like you just tell them what you need and they'll be so happy to accommodate you and i've had a really amazing experience at my workplace like people have been so kind and just understanding and generous and they're just like without even asking many questions, just like, yeah, of course, it just becomes um, a matter of fact. Yeah, Simone needs that. Yeah. And then just sometimes they say, oh, we're going out for drinks and they just pick a bar that is like half a second away from the office. And I'm just like, wow, thank you. I appreciate that. And then I think about it. I'm like, I would do the same for someone else. It's not like big of a deal, but I still really appreciate that. But at the same time, as like I'm gonna be honest, as someone in a wheelchair, there have been so many times where people have been like, "Oh, let's go out," and then it's like, "But we're not gonna invite David because now we have to make all these arrangements that we wouldn't necessarily have to make because I'm in a wheelchair." So, yeah. like you're talking about your privilege, and yeah. I'm talking about my privilege. And I think that there's two sides. There's there's the positives and negatives to both sides of it. Like the fact that you can walk up steps, even if it's a step or two. Don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about like a flight of stairs, which sucks. I cannot. You can't even. I cannot. One step. Oh, it, one step. Just it, it, it would hurt it, me so much. I yeah. can do it. I physically can do it, but it just. But it's so painful. No I get it. For me. I get it. Wow. Okay. So I guess it's the same thing. I then. lived uh, until last December. I was living in a walk up, and I was pretty much stuck at home for <laughs> for years. I was wow. going out of my house like once a week, like. Shh. I'm so lucky to now be in an elevator building and I can just go out. Yeah. Wow. 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 Okay. I didn't, I didn't realize that, that was impacting you quite that much. I'm, I'm, that sucks. Yeah. 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 And people sometimes I think see, um, see me standing maybe in a photo and that's the only second I was standing, right? right. Like just because I was taking that photo and I'm very lucky that I get to do that. I get to stand for that second, but at the same time, I'm just like, um, yeah, what you see is not really the reality here in my real life and the people who actually are here on a day-to-day -day basis they know it they mm -hmm. see it for real mm -hmm. so wait, i i'm gonna i'm gonna jump from there into something which i think is really important when we talk about um communications and about getting ideas across very often what we see online and what we see in the moment like the photo that was taken that's not reality like we deal with a reality which is much deeper than what we're experiencing in like when people put themselves on Facebook or on LinkedIn or wherever, have you seen 
that differentiation between like the reality and the online reality as someone who works in the field like here's reality reality and then here's like that that thing that we show people and is how do you play with that in your job how does that become do you understand my question does it make sense yeah i it's a really it's a really good question i think over i'm i'm trying so hard to do two things one is to be as honest and transparent as possible. So I try sometimes on social media, even just if it's an Instagram story, to remind people of the, of just to show a little bit of the honest backstage of things and, uh, or the backstory or what you don't see. And I kind of remind them, hey, actually, I, you see me flying so much. I use assistance at every airport I go to. I'm, uh, I'm in a wheelchair and that's my only way that I could actually cross a whole airport and get to the gate. That's uh, like, or standing line. Like, obviously that's the only way I can make it happen. And then there are all these things that we just don't share. And obviously we are uh, socialized to polish our images like crazy and to present these super likable, super perfect versions of ourselves. And it's not just about looks, okay? It's not just about applying a nice filter that makes your skin look good. I'm talking about actually not showing all the struggles that go behind, that, are, that, that lie behind um, an achievement. And I, I really, on one hand, I'm trying to do more of that. On the other hand, I'm also trying to share less in general. I'm just like, I'm becoming over the years more protective of my personal lives, of my life and what happens behind the scenes. And I think I've done a pretty decent job at it, even though I'm a natural sharer and I'm a very enthusiastic person and my instinct is to share. I'm just becoming a little more um, careful and cautious with how I use social media. Does that answer your question or? Yes, on the personal front. I'm I'm wondering also on the professional front, you work in the field of communications, which means you try and give, you know, best face for a company, whatever company it is, it doesn't matter. Do you see, have you found, or you can even talk about, you know, previous, uh, you know, you don't have to talk about where you're working right now, but even in previous jobs or when you were a journalist, was there, did you see that differentiation between what, what was like being presented and what, what reality sort of was and how, how does that sort of come into play as someone who works in a profession where you have to get ideas across? Like your job is to get people to ascribe to your idea, the company's idea, whatever it is, like come join us on this process of becoming this, becoming that, whatever it is. Absolutely. Um, that's so true. So that was one of the biggest challenges, I think, from moving about moving from journalism into communications, because um, in journalism, you try as hard as possible not to have an agenda and just to say, of course, everything gets framed. Who you choose to interview is just a framing process of the story. So mm -hmm. I'm not sitting here and lying to you and saying to you that there is, that it's just news is completely neutral and completely abstract from people's biases because it's not true but the intention Ob there is a it's completely objective it's completely objective <laughs> right right <laughs> but there is a very at least in the places that i've worked for there is a really well stated intention about like let's hear different sides like mm -hmm. hear different perspectives um and that's also like an issue that so we could have a whole podcast about to both sideism and how like <laughs> now in journalism we're starting to realize hey giving both sides doesn't mean that like we have to when we write that the earth is uh, is round then we have to go and interview also the person that says that the it's, earth is flat you know right. like just yeah, like yeah, we don't yeah. have yeah. to take both sides into an extreme right? right but when it comes to going into communications and all of a sudden of course you're presenting only the good things about your product and about your company but I could, I could not work for a, if I went into a company and I saw that what we're sharing and just, it's just the tip of an iceberg. And then there is a whole iceberg underneath of really nasty things or a product that really doesn't work well of dissatisfied clients. I, I just could not work there. So I'm, I'm happy to say that I've worked for places that where I just like my mission as a, persuader and communicator and storyteller aligned 
quite closely with how I saw things being run and how I saw the product perform. Otherwise, I would just have a really hard time doing that and feeling okay with myself. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. I think that that brings in the personal side to it. And I think it's also really true. I think if someone's going to face that reality of, hey, I I can't do this because you're asking me not necessarily to lie, but to like really fudge the truth here and like, like blur out the reality of what's going on. I guess it leads to a second question though, which is you mentioned that there's the issue of like, or not the issue, the idea of, hey, you know, yes, there's stuff going on in the background, which we're not sharing because you do want to put it in the best light. Have you guys ever considered or have you ever considered as part of that process sort of giving people that behind the scenes look at like, here's a failure. Here's the thing that we did really badly. And here's how we're improving on it. Like, yes, you put it in a good light of here's how we're improving on it. But you have opened up that door to show people what's going on. Is that something you guys you've done? I'm curious. So there is obviously a big difference when you're working for a company. You're not... Um you don't own it and you don't, um, it's not my company and I don't, um, I just want to say it right. Like when it comes to my own story and when it comes to my own decision to share a personal failure or, or just a behind the scenes that is not so flattering, it's truly my decision. It's my call to make. Here we're talking about big organizations where a lot, the stakes are high and I don't own that information and I kind of like just... Um, lend my skills and my services and my time to a uh, bigger mission for other people, right? And um, what what happens is that it's not really my call to make that uh, decision. But if uh, if an organization were to share a failure and how they've learned a lesson, I think they would do it after after that issue has been solved. They would never show it to you in the midst of it. And that's really interesting because there are these major, major, major tech companies today or other corporations in which you see them kind of like go into crisis live. And you see, for example, Twitter employees right now <laughs> tweeting live <laughs> what's happening at their office. And then like, we are being asked to, to print out uh, the code that we've written in the last 30 days. Oh, and two hours later, oh, now we're being asked to bring all the code that we printed into the shredder because Elon has decided it was actually a bad idea. So like, it's <laughs> really fascinating when you get that really unique opportunity to see something unfold in real time. And I think right. the bigger the organization, um, the bigger the scrutiny and the higher the chances that you have to actually not be able to, to, to hide all of that. I think that's a really good, I, I, I love the, 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 you know, talking, it's like real time. We're talking about it. It's happening right now. Right now, people are still tweeting about what's going on in, yeah. in Twitter and everything's going on. Um, wow. Okay. okay. Um, all right, I want to take us back for a minute because you, you mentioned ideational hierarchy at some point and your own personal ideational hierarchy. I'm curious, how mm. much did your ideational hierarchy impact your choice of places to apply for a job? When you looked at places, how often did you go, mm, I would not work there because I don't approve of some of their values or you know what, I would apply there even if it's not as good as these other choices, but I want to apply there because... They stand for something, at least on some level, they say they stand for something, which I, I think is worthwhile. I'm curious if that even played a role in any oh. of your decision making in this process. So it does 100%, but I have in, in more desperate times when I was jobless, I did apply uh, for um, to jobs uh, at places that um, whose mission didn't really fully align. And especially I'm talking about nonprofits. Or uh, just uh, or just organizations that might have a, a clear political uh, motive, and I just it was really hard because I said I need a job. This is where I have a connection. I'm just gonna apply. Probably they're not even gonna accept me. And and then I found myself get to the very last day, final stage of the interview process, and really asking myself. Shh, like what happens <laughs> you can say it, it's okay i don't mind <laughs> send me an offer and i need a job and i need to like like i need to post on linkedin that i joined this organization and like my just i do all of a sudden represent it and i sometimes see other people being stuck in those positions i know people who are who have dedicated their entire 
careers to organizations and I know in their private lives uh, and their, their, their private beliefs don't always align with their organization's statements or um, actions and it, and it must be hard for them. So I, I feel like I always tell myself, like, hey, I, but it's easy to say when you have a job and you can choose to apply and it's easier to say that, right? But then when you, um, and I, I strongly prefer um, having, just working for in tech, for example, like, yes, of course, a tech company has its own beliefs and advances its own, um, just its own um, vision of the world. But at the end of the day, what we're just trying to sell is just a product. It's a solution that is supposed to make other, co- I work in B2B, business to business. I don't sell to consumers, so I sell to businesses. And I'm just like, hey, this product is really going to make your business this much more efficient is going to save you this much money and it's going to make your employees so much happier. So um, it's so much easier for me to do that than to go into a nonprofit or a political organization that has some sort of um, just they have to put out statements about everything that happens. And, and I just don't want to do that. I really at this point of my life, I don't want to do that. Um, I think I'll tell you this. I only have one life. We all do. I think. And I think it has to have some meaning to me and to the people I'm surrounded with. And obviously, I'm just a small person in a big world. And I don't think I can. I have much impact on a macro level. Um, But yes, on a micro level, I think I have I can have we all can have a huge impact. And let me give you an example. I saw it with my book. Um, I was very lucky to publish this novel when I was like, what? I was like in grad school. And um I just, uh, it was... You, you had just graduated from, like, you had literally just graduated from Bar Ilan. I was so impressed. It was, like, yeah. the year afterwards, and it was, like, I published a book. I was, like, Crazy. what? <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> yeah, no, it was really insane, because it, I happened to be a little successful in Italy, and I had to, I really, I sold thousands of copies, and I got to go on a national tour, and I was interviewed by all these newspapers, and sometimes I... I had to remind myself, hey, this might not enjoy it because it might not happen again. And obviously mm-hmm. my hope is that it will happen again, but I don't know. How, again, going back to that whole, um, just that whole um, topic that we were talking about before, right? About how things might not happen in the way that you expect them to happen. And like, if it happens again, I don't really know how it's going to happen or when, and I have to be open to that, right? But I... I saw the impact that that book had on readers. I had readers of all ages, but especially on young readers. Um, I had readers come up to me and say like, hey, that book had a big impact on me. And I just reminded me of the power of words and of just like, whoa, I had, I did this in my own privacy, in my own little room in Givachuel. And I just like, um, but it ended up just, just having a much bigger impact. And, uh, um, I think that that was just a, a big lesson I learned. I think that's amazing. I think the fact that you you were able to do so much at the same time also cuz you were also working when you were you were at Barilan. It wasn't that you were you were just studying. You yeah. were also you were also working and you were you know trying to get this this book done and so much stuff all going on at once. Um I'm curious. Okay, I I I'm curious how the lessons that we learned in in class besides ideational hierarchy have you seen them sort of come to fruit like have they applied in your life like you 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 say you have visions and you have like this idea of what you want the world to be for your world to be right the things you'd like to see yourself get done and you've accepted that it's not going to necessarily like you the plan and reality have you know thrown you for the loop as it normally does but where have you seen sort of other lessons come into play and or are there lessons that I, you can go dr leitner with all due respect i like you very much but you're wrong and here's why you're wrong about this i would love to learn about that so any, yeah. any ideas any thoughts i think that so much we we first of all it was a great course that one we we i took i took intro to government and politics i think with you and then we talked so much about a uh, power and um, leadership even then and participate, power participation in elections. And we can talk about that in a second if you want, just like how, um, what the, what I feel about that. But, um, I also learned in the seminar that we did together on leadership and strategy where we learn all those frameworks and those theories and we tried to apply them to things that we cared about or things that our own realities like campus politics and just like, hey, like, 
we learn about how I think so much can be accomplished when we develop a strategy to achieve our goal, our goals. And also remember when we talked about leadership and you said, um, and we talked about the different characteristics of a leader and how to just, just, um, we looked around the classroom and to just kind of identify the leaders we knew in our own world. And, and I just like everybody started, started mentioning like, yeah, I know Ro Yeager and I'm, I'm sorry I mentioned her. I hope she's okay no, with it, but it's just like she was just truly, fine. truly a leader in our, in our just little world. And, um, and it was so interesting to that how you I really appreciated how you tried to um, help us apply some of those big theories into um, our own little world. How have you seen that come into play? Like when you look in your business now, are you able to go, wait, that's the manager. Mm -hmm. But but in this discussion, that's the leader. Are you able to apply that in your world? Are you seeing it? Absolutely. Absolutely. There are people in position of leadership that are actually not leaders. And I'm not talking about my workplace now. I'm talking about in general. You, you can clearly see it because the leader is actually not the person who is necessarily in charge. It's sometimes the person that people go to when they have a question or they go to to seek guidance from. And I think that's where I think that's something I teach my students a lot because I teach communications and public speaking, and I think communication in general is so underestimated, right? And writing well, knowing how to read, and how to practice active listening, how to be, how have to have empathy, and how to explain something to other people who might not have the same experience or context that we have, okay? That's a huge um, tool, I think, to become a good leader. And it's so valuable, and I teach my students some of these skills, and I... Um, teach them how to deliver a speech in public and they come back to me and say, hey, this was so helpful in my job. Thank you. And um, in some environments, there are some parents that teach kids, oh, math is so important and learn science and learn how to code. And uh, you can be a great scientist or coder, sure. And you may have those skills, but if you're not a good leader and you can't communicate your ideas and you can't persuade others that your agenda and the way you think things should be conducted um, is, uh, is just the way forward, I don't think you'll achieve your full potential. So I think that um, that's where I think communication is so important. And having also empathy and emotional intelligence, knowing how to connect with others too. Oh, absolutely. I definitely think that being able to see the other and experience things through their eyes and being able to say, wait a second, I may not agree with this person, but I can see it through their eyes. I understand how they are experiencing this process that we're going through, and that can allow me to better talk them, talk with them and engage with them is definitely an essential skill if we can teach it. I think children should learn it from little, from young age onward. Um, it's a very hard skill to teach though, because it's, it's, it's not, it's something that comes naturally for little, little, little kids. And then they lose it at some point because they become very ego, egocentric and it's very right. much about them for a while. And you need to sort of accept that that's part of the process where like, you know, the teenage years <laughs> or the preteen teenage years, it suddenly becomes a lot about them and you need to sort of help them over that bridge and find that point of, okay, you've gone through this now. Do you see how you need to see more than yourself, how you can see the other. I think that's a very, very important skill. And um, I, I'm thrilled that you're teaching it to your students because it is so important. Um, I'm curious, like when we spoke about it in class, we talked about, when we spoke about leadership, we spoke about different leadership styles and we spoke about about the, the idea that leadership's a process. Um, and I think that when you're talking about communication, one of the things you're saying is, inherent to the leadership process is the ability to communicate again and again and again and change your communications, the f nature of your communication to address the different people in that process and the different stages in that process. Is that like a good way to describe? Different audiences, yes. The different different audiences? And 100%, also different, 100%. Like, different stages also like, hey, we're at the beginning of this process. Wait, now we're in the crux. Like we're, we're hit, we've hit a, uh, there's this huge boulder in our path. How are we gonna talk about this boulder? Are we gonna talk about it as, oh my God, it's a problem. Or is this an obstacle that we can move around or somehow get over, right? Like 
the, the way we talk about things is super duper important. I think that what you're saying, and that you please correct me if I'm wrong, is that the nature of leadership is that you have to understand effective communication in order to not only get people on board, but then also help them through the process as you are their leader, like get, to get where you want to go to create that vision in reality. Would that be a, uh, like, is that accurate? What you're trying to say accurately, what you're trying to say? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Very, very, very cool. Um, so can you give me an example of a point in your professional life where you found yourself emerging as a leader on some concept and went, Hey, this, this is where we want to go. And, and can you sort of talk me through a little bit of how you did that, how you might've engaged different leadership styles or different, different aspects of communication to try and deal with whatever it is you wanted to do. Is that possible? And it's okay for you to say no. Oh, wow. I think that this is, um, no, this is um, almost like a job interview. No, I'm kidding. So I'm so um, sorry. I... <laughs> You're not being no, interviewed. No, I mean, no, You are technically being interviewed, but it's not that kind of interview. <laughs> I think, um, rather than sharing a story, I think that okay. I, I can share a few skills that have helped me be a more effective leader or a more effective just person to... Uh, work with and and that I really want to reiterate what we said before how people in charge are not always leaders meaning sometimes the people who are not in charge go just can just express the way forward and just express their ideas and in the end we end up following their plan and it just like who was the leader in that situation? Was it the person, the manager? Or was it just the person who came up with that whole plan? And uh, um, that, that I think is really important. I think just, first of all, in terms of advice and things that I have learned along the way is to observe before you jump into a situation. Um, the learning process is really important and just sitting there and absorbing all that information that might not come, not information might not be available to you all together at the same time. So you might, it might take some time before all the different pieces of the puzzle are available to you, right? It's as if you had the box with all the pieces of the puzzle, but I'm asking you to complete the puzzle, but I'm giving you a few pieces at a time, right? And that's, I think, more realistic view of how we are, um, how we navigate our jobs and our careers. And enthusiasm is great. I am, I think enthusiasm has always been one of my greatest weapons, but also one of my greatest weaknesses almost yeah, kind yeah. of okay, like yeah. it's yeah. great but always it should be paired with some healthy cynicism meaning enthusiasm has always helped me just jump on board and really have that energy that maybe other people might not have and just have the passion to stay up all night to complete something but at the same time it should be paired with cynicism which i have learned along the way as we discussed earlier and i think that that can be a good a good match together but also another skill that i really have learned not not that i have learned that i've mastered but i have learned the importance of is being easy to work with um and that's also underestimated so maybe that's not a skill you'll write in your resume okay you're not going to write in your resume that you are i'm easy to work with um but it's something that all of your past managers are likely to mention in their referrals and in their letters of recommendations. And what does that really mean? It obviously means different things depending on your, on your line of work, but uh, it means, again, being great at communication. So if you're good at asking clear questions, uh, then you'll get clear answers. And the same goes with answering other people's questions. If I go to someone with questions and they just confuse me even more, um, then I don't find it easy to work with them. I'm going to go to someone else next time. So another part of it is getting straight to the point, kind of being direct and straightforward. And that can be challenging, especially when you work with uh, cross-cultural teams. Uh, we all have, every culture has different communication styles and some are more uh, direct than others. Um, I know maybe as an American, you might be surprised to hear this, but American communication style, well, you live in Israel, so you know this very well, American communication <laughs> style is not the most direct, necessarily. It's more direct 
than other communication styles, mm -hmm. but it's not the most direct. Like Israelis, Israelis will tell you exactly where you stand. Um, <laughs> like... Yes, I disagree. This was not done well. I remember one of my favorite mentors and people. Like he would literally, he's told me a few times. This he would look at something I had done and say, "This is." S H I T, like literally, <laughs> and I was like, "Whoa!" And and he was just, just let's not sugarcoat it. Let's not say, um, let's not say like Americans would be more likely to say, "Oh, this is great," but what about we look at it from this other perspective? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I think just getting straight to the point doesn't mean to be rude or to hurt other people's feelings, but it's just whenever you need to communicate a piece of information, I think you want to be easy to understand. Because if I'm not sure whether my manager liked what I did or not, that's a problem. Right. No, but I think it's very interesting because you're mentioning there's almost two sides to that coin that you're mentioning. On the one hand, be direct, but on the other hand, acknowledge the fact that there are different cultural perspectives on what that means. Now, being direct in Israel or in America or in Italy is going to be very, very different. And when you work for a multinational, you have to, and you have multinationals on your team that you or people that you're dealing with, you have to acknowledge and learn the different natures of what being direct means and how to be direct with, like when you're direct with someone who's from Japan, it's very, very different than when you are direct with someone from Israel or when you're direct with someone from India. They all have very different concepts of what it means to get to the point. And so like you're saying on the one hand, be direct and get to the point. But on the other hand, try and be culturally sensitive to what that means for the people you're dealing with. And that's gotta be a very hard thing to do when you're dealing with a multinational group. Oh yeah, 1000%, 1000%. And I, you, you nailed it, it's exactly what I feel. It's just like, yes, being, not being direct can be a really huge liability and might not, uh, might, be, might become a problem down the line. But at the same time, I think that having that awareness that different cultures communicate in different ways. And as you say, being direct means something different in different cultures. I think that 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 is so important to learn when you work in these kind of environments. And just to add one more point, I wanted just yeah. to add one more point about like okay. being easy to work with. I think also another part of that puzzle is to be able to identify roadblocks. So whenever you get stuck on a project, I think you, you you're you know what those rod roadblocks are and you report them to your teammates and to your manager and you're able then to solve them together. So kind of like not shy away from facing problems um, head on. So I think that that's, that's an aspect of communication, which is, which is it, it, if we think about Lencioni's pyramid, right? Lencioni's pyramid is based on the idea of trust and then it allows for effective internal conflicts to be resolved and then it allows for people to commit and then be accountable and reach results so you're basically saying if i can't trust that i can talk openly here with the knowledge that it might lead to some kind of conflict but at least we can resolve that conflict and in some way commit to a future state of here's who's in charge of what in order to overcome these problems right that is that what you're saying yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely wow, okay Recognize really cool cause... what's holding you back and and express it. Right. So I think that's really and interesting. And that cause... might even mean acknowledging that you have that you have um, a lack of like maybe just uh, hey, I don't know how to do this. I am the roadblock. I don't and have the skill set. You have to have the honesty of like owning yeah, and saying like I don't know how to do this. Teach me or like just all of that, I think that that can be also an asset. Wow, I think that that's a really interesting point. I, and I think that students, when they're graduating, need to be, acknowledge the fact that when they jump into a new job, they're not going to know how to do everything that they're going to be asked to do. They might have some of the skills they need, but there's no chance that they're going to have all of them. And if they're not willing to acknowledge that deficiency in self and trust that the people that they work with are going to be open to teaching them and, and, and they can find that comfort zone of, hey, here are the people I feel comfortable going to when I have this problem. Or better yet, knowing who their mentors are and the people that they're being told, hey, when you have an issue, 
this person's here for you. That's their job. That part of their, their, their job description is not to berate you, but to help guide you through that process is super duper important. And I think like my experience has been with young people who've gone into workforce. I've had people come back to me and be like, I understand why they're so frustrated with me. Yada, yada. And I'm like, well, have you, have you asked them what skills you need to improve on? Have you, have you, can you identify for yourself where you're having issues, not not what issues they're having with you, but where's where's your problem? What what is it that's causing you the difficult difficulty of accomplishing the tasks that they're giving you? And I think that that's an interesting point that's really great for a, a recent graduate to know, because like if you only learn it when you're yes, you know, 50, 60 years old, you have a problem on your hands. Um, okay, so I'm I'm curious. Having said that, like, is there any other advice that you might give to uh, a, a young graduate, someone who's about to join the workforce? Join the workforce, do an MA. Like, uh, what what do you see right now, and where you're working, or in the the high tech world, as like, here's really where things are sort of moving. What you need to be considering if you want to go into, I mean, we're talking about market content marketing, right? That's that's sort of where you're at right now in the world of content marketing. What's the best option for someone? Where, where does, wh- how does someone get into this field and how do they, what do they need to be doing to get there? So there's no clear path for all these jobs and that applies to journalism too. Um, I chose to go to journalism school. That's not something that every aspiring journalist needs to do. Needs to do. Absolutely not. And um, also school. School is not for everyone. There are very successful people that have not gone to college for me, I knew that was the right path for me or something I wanted to do. It's a place where you can just like, of course, you can read a million books on your own. But like, how do you, A, know which books to read? Who are you going to discuss them with after reading them? And do you have on your own the discipline to sit down and to absorb all that information on your own? Um, that's Those are the questions that I would ask someone who says like, I don't want to go to, I don't need to go to college. And if you are saying, yes, I have that, I'm surrounded by very, very um, knowledgeable people who can guide me. I'm, I have my own self-discipline and yeah, go for it. If you feel that you want that framework um, to find yourself and to explore different paths, I think college can be great. Also, I met some of my best friends in college, obviously, so I'm very, very glad I did go to college. Um, grad school was so important to me. I just, I, I really, it was, it was really, really a formative experience, and I'm just so glad I did that. I had some of the most incredible professors. I had an, a level of access to people and to uh, organizations that I would have not had without that framework. So, um, We've already talked throughout the whole session. I think today, we, a whole episode today, we've talked about different skills that you might find helpful. So obviously we talked about being easy to work with, having communication skills, um, how to be an effective leader. So all of that applies. Um, but not everything is for everyone. So there is no one path that I can tell you to follow. Okay, that's fair enough. I think that it's important for to say, though. I think it's important to say, look, there, there isn't one way to get to this job. It's you If you're interested in working in this field or in journalism or whatever, there's multiple paths in front of you. What is best for you will be best for you. Um, if I can take just a few more minutes with you, I would love to quickly discuss your work as an advocate for the Reflex Sympathetic Dystrophy Syndrome Association. Also, the just to put it into reference for people, Reflex Sympathetic Dystrophy is the name that used to be, or then that was what it used to be called, CRPS. Now it's called complex regional pain syndrome. It used to be called reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Both of us are dealing with this on a day-to-day basis. For those of you who don't know, complex regional pain syndrome is the uh, most painful known chronic pain syndrome to modern medicine. It involves a great deal of burning pain, consistent continual pain, but there is also, for many people who suffer it, a aspect of pain from touch called allodynia, and it is excruciating, (laughs) to say the least. But I don't want to talk about the pain. What I want to talk about, Simone, is that you have made a choice to advocate to get awareness out there and to let people know about the syndrome. 
that choice means that this is, I mean, you don't have a choice that this is part of your life, which means it's part of your ideational hierarchy, whether you want it to be or not. But at the same time, you are making a choice to do something about it. And I would like to hear from you a little bit about what you are doing in that realm. Can you share with me a little bit what you're doing as an advocate for CRPS people? Um, thank you for that. Um, just giving our, uh, the audience that, that explanation, the context. Uh, um, it's, it's like we find ourselves having to explain what CRPS is all the time because it's, not a, it's a rare disease. So it's not a well-known disease, but it comes... It's just when you say it, we deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis... Um, you're right, but I would say on a second, second, <laughs> moment by moment no basis. <laughs> break from it. There is, yes, there is no one break from it. And people, a lot of people who suffer from other types of chronic pain and, um, they, they might all, not always relate to that because they're like, oh yeah, I suffer from chronic pain. I'm like, well, I suffer from chronic pain every second of the day and I'm completely aware of it even when I'm asleep mm -hmm. because I wake up so many times mm -hmm. all, all the night like all, every night and then sometimes people ask me hey oh you texted me at three in the morning what were you doing up at three in the morning I'm like I I'm like <laughs> I don't have your normal sleep schedule and right. I'm just like I, I, I lost that and I think that uh, I as you say very correctly I don't have a choice um, regarding dealing with this um, disease, but I do have a choice about what to make with it. And while I'm no longer at the very beginning, when you're first, the first year or two that you're diagnosed and you're dealing with all those questions, like, why did this happen? Why does this disease even exist? Um, what did I, every time you have pain, like a flare, like an extra level, a layer of pain, you're like, oh, what did I do wrong? And sometimes you didn't do anything wrong. It's just like, you can't control so much of it, right? And obviously, you, there are a lot of things that you can't control and you learn them along the way and you've had it for so many more years than me. So you've probably mastered that much better than me. And I'm still... I feel like I'm learning. To navigate that, I still feel. I still but, feel like I'm learning on a day to day basis at times. Like, can I do this? I'm gonna chest myself again. Can I try this thing? Oh no, I can't do that. Oh, there's gonna be a day of rest mm. after today, or isn't there? Oh boy. Like on yeah. a day to day basis. Yeah. And uh, but what do I have a what do I have a choice about? And my choice was, hey, I have these skills. I have these communication skills. I know how to talk to people, I know how to write, um, and let's use it. And then I have put out some videos, or ex just, I've, first of all, my main, um, my main uh, effort is to be um, on the communications committee of RSDSA, which is the national, just the largest national organization in the United States for people, to support people affected by CRPS, and just, um, that has been an amazing journey so far, and on my personal level, I put out videos, short videos in which I explain what CRPS is. I write articles or I, um, I've done a video series when I did a, a trial for um, my dorsal root ganglion neurostimulator, which I have had for the last two years in my spine to help me cope with like a percentage of that pain that I have, especially with the allodynia part. I think that um, I realized when I was undergoing that process um, and you've undergone a lot of those processes, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a huge effort to undergo those different processes, plus the emotional burden of being like, will this work? This has to work. I have no choice but to make this work, and mm -hmm. it's really out of your control sometimes. It's just most times, it really, all those things that you try really just end up not working. Right. And I think that I realize, hey, all the material that I'm finding online about this device is produced and put out by um and distributed by the pharma the company. like the medical company yeah. um that produces this uh, this device and i'm not okay with that i want to hear from the people who actually have it and it's so true the company will come and tell you they give you these beautiful brochures where you see someone doing gardening work and uh -huh. you're like you're gonna <laughs> go back to your life and um this is um, the, the part before you put in the, the permanent device you, you put in for a few days, you have a, just a trial device that you put in just to see if it works, if it's worth undergoing the whole process. And they're like a painless and super easy, um, trial. And I'm like, 
that was not painless. That was not easy. I had to disrupt my entire life for weeks. I had to depend completely on my partner to help me at home. Just all of that. I said, hey, I need to tell people this stuff. Like, I want to find online... I want to put out online the videos and the content that I would like to find myself as a person affected by this disease going through these things. So I started doing that and slowly and I feel like I'm just getting started and I hopefully in the next few years I'll put out more stuff. I plan on, hopefully I'll have the courage to start also talking about career and CRPS, how to have a job um, that matches your needs and all of that. I feel like I'm really just getting started. Okay. I think it's awesome that you're even taking on that challenge. I, I share on Facebook and on Instagram every once in a while, I'll post, you know, when I'm in a pain moment and I'll sort of explain what I'm going through or if I'm about to be going to do something and I take a day of rest beforehand, I have been posting about it, but it's more on the personal level. It's not more, it's not so much informative for other people. Hey, here's how this experience has been for me. Um, partially because I did all the surgeries and stuff like before 2010 and I like Facebook was not a big thing for me. I, I, I only joined Facebook in like 2012, uh, no, 2015 or something. So like, but at the same time, I think that it's amazing that you're choosing to share on the personal level, but not about your personal struggle, but rather as a, this is for other people to be able to learn what my experience has been like so that they can make informed choices. And I think that that is such an advocacy thing to do for people with CRPS. Like you are advocating for them by sharing how your experience has been for you so that they can learn better how it might be for them. That's amazing. So I like, yes, you're cool that you are, are doing that. That's Thank out of everything you've talked about from my perspective is just huge. Um, all right. Um, I've actually kept you longer than I promised to keep you. So I'm going to keep you for one more minute and ask one question. Is there anything that I didn't talk about or didn't ask about, or is there anything that you would like us to quickly discuss something of import to you, something you think is important to tell students, something you'd like to talk to me about? The floor is yours. Nothing. I just, um, I just really appreciated um, having this conversation with you. And I just want to, if I can just give one last like parting wor word is that um, just for people to have more empathy for others, we all have different situations and different lives, but all we do is just we all want fulfilling lives and we deserve that. And if the system we operate in is built to preclude us from that fulfillment, that's a big problem. And I'm talking about if we have a disability and the system that we're trying to operate in is just not built for people like us. Or if I am in a same sex marriage or partnership and or or I'm I'm just like in love with someone of the same sex. I'm just like throwing different examples. I'm not e equating the two. I'm just giving different examples of situations that might be unique to people. And the system you're operating in, like your country, just just does not allow you to actually live that fulfilling life of having a family or having children and how are you supposed to do it and of course I'm very privileged I got to move to a different to a new country and build a new life and just I always think about the people who were born at a different time where some of the privileges I have were not available or about people who are born in different places where those privileges have not been um, just uh, gained yet so um, I'm just like, let's think about it. Let's make the world a little more accommodating for people that might not look exactly like us, but at the end of the day, they want what we want, which is to live a fulfilling life. I think that's amazing and very beautiful. And thank you, because that's a great way to close out. That, that hope that no matter what, what our beliefs are or our value systems are, perhaps we can have that empathy for another person to say, hey, at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. We want to be happy, we want to feel fulfilled, we want to enjoy our lives, and we want to feel like our lives had worth, have worth on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Simone, thank you. That was actually really beautiful. Um, thank you for joining me. Uh, I wish you all the best in your many, many endeavors. I look forward to reading your next book, which I didn't even get to ask when that's coming out. So uh, we'll talk about that at some point. Um, and I hope to have you back at some point on the show so 
you know, learn more. I feel like I learned a lot on this about what what it means to deal with this this disease in the high tech world, and also what it means just to bring yourself your you, I want to say bring your best self forward, no matter what it is you're trying to do. And I think that that's a really important lesson for everybody to learn is try and bring your best self forward and don't don't necessarily hide yourself away from just because you're dealing with something. Bring your best self, even when you're dealing with something, bring your best self forward. Here's what I can do. Here's what I can't do. Here's what I'm capable of physically or emotionally or skill wise, no matter what. I think it's all the same overall gist, gist, gist of an idea. Bring your best self forward and be prepared to accept that you don't know everything and you're going to learn along the way. And I think that those are all really important lessons for me. And I think they're very important lessons for people who are choosing whether or not they're going to be in college and important lessons for people who are going to be joining the workforce after university and for people who are in the workforce now who are a little wary of sharing their best or or bringing their best self forward because they they don't feel comfortable or safe to do so for whatever reason. And I think it's important we create environments that allow that to happen. So thank you so very much for being with me. And again, so, so, so amazed by the amount of stuff that you do and get done. Really keep it up. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us in the Doctor's Den. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Hope to see you next time.